Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Webinar Wednesday brought to you by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. Today we are talking about corrosion assessments for marine concrete bridge elements. Uh, as I said, this program is brought to you by the Concrete Preservation Alliance. We are a coalition committed to the advancement of best practices in the field of concrete preservation. We draw on our members to get speakers to promote education and awareness of concrete repair uh, industry standards and new innovative corrosion prevention te technologies, as well as sustainable construction practices. This is the second of a four part series focused on the preservation of marine structures. Previously, we covered parking structures and we also had an extensive series on bridge preservation. You can find the recording for those and the presentation slides uh, on our website, wesafestructures.info in our events section. Mr. Bill Horn is the is going to be giving us the presentation today. He is the president at NDT Corporation, a professional engineer and with over 25 years of experience in non-destructive testing. He's definitely the kind of guy you want to be presenting on this topic. With that said, I'm going to let him take it away. Very good. Ben, thank you very much. Let me just share the screen here and I'll bring up the uh, presentation. Make sure that everything is going forward. Very good. Is the presentation outline up, Ben? We looking OK? You're looking good. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to cover a little bit of corrosion overview. There's been some uh, other presentations on corrosion, so I'm not going to do a deep dive on that, but I am going to discuss more details on non-destructive testing theory, some of the equipment that's out there to gain some information, both testing from the surface and through testing uh, different concrete elements. And then we are going to talk about various bridge elements uh, composed of concrete uh, and other various materials, uh, decks, piers, piles, uh, some PT tendons. We will leave some questions at the end, so please uh, uh, send those in the chat and we'll go from there. Uh, while I don't have a, a song that relates to our topic today, Neil Young in 1970 horse, 1979 uh, did release an album, Rust Never Sleeps. So hopefully that will resonate with some of the audience members here today as we talk about visual signs of deterioration and corrosion. And by the time it gets to this uh, stage where the concrete cover has spalled off and the rebar is beginning to corrode, it's uh, a little bit late, uh, certainly could still repair this, but the extent of the repairs would be more considerable. Uh, the are, are a number of traditional inspection methods out there, visual inspection, sounding, certainly some lab testing that's required uh, for full evaluation. But uh, this afternoon, we wanna concentrate a little bit more on uh, ground penetrating radar, half cell potential testing, and how energy waves uh, propagate through different material. Um, going to do that to try to understand the cause of deterioration. I uh, don't want to just rush right into a repair strategy without fully understanding what caused that deterioration and making sure that we're targeting our repair efforts to mitigate the deterioration in the future. Uh, I did mention there is uh, a very appropriate uh, need for uh, core and lab testing uh, for uh, various uh, tests such as chloride concentration or even photography, trying to quantify the alkali silica reaction. Uh, photography is just kind of a, a, a clear cut through the concrete matrix and then looking at it under a microscope. Uh, but to really understand the corrosion deterioration in terms of time as it relates to some of these non-destructive test methods, uh, we want to go back in time. We want to catch the deterioration as early as possible. And uh, as I said before, the, the sounding or the visual inspection is a little bit late. Uh, ground penetrating radar, half cell potential, uh, the impact echo, sonic testing uh, can help us recognize where the deterioration is occurring before it's very visible. <clears throat> now here's an image of a delamination survey. Uh, the white hashed area on the outer part of the concrete is where it sounded deteriorated or delaminated, but we can look a little bit further and see where some of the concrete might be debonded or delaminated. And that would be represented by the yellow uh, shading on this particular image. 
But what caused that delamination or debonding is the active corrosion. And when we do the corrosion evaluation and testing, that helps us understand where this deterioration is occurring even deeper inside the structure and further back in time. So just some corrosion basics. There has been some other presentations that have done a great job of explaining them. I'm not going to cover that, but I, we do recognize that there are chloride induced corrosion, carbonation that can affect corrosion, uh, a concrete corrosion cell with an anode and a cathode and electrolyte path, and, and what the repair solutions are as far as mitigating those conditions. Uh, within, say, a patch repair, we've got uh, chloride contaminated concrete in the existing structure, and we're going to put a, uh, a patch next to it while it's still the same rebar. Um, we have an anode, we have a cathode, we have uh, an opportunity for those electrons to continue their deterioration. And at that interface where there's a patch, even if it's saw cut and done properly according to some of the guidelines in ACI or ICRI, you could still have significant deterioration, again, right at that interface. Uh, this construction joint here, we've got new concrete that was constructed. Uh, on the top half of this wall and they left the old part of the wall in place because at the time it seemed uh, sufficient and right at that interface of the two concrete sections is where that construction joint that corrosion really accelerated rapidly and that's very uh, visible here both in the concrete spalling and the corrosion of the rebar so uh, recognizing just throwing concrete in on a repair without understanding the cause might not mitigate the whole solution or be the best repair option for your particular structure. Uh, and sacrificial galvanic anodes are very appropriate. Uh, they can be tied to the rebar. Obviously, the concrete needs to be uh, prepped properly and uh, all the deteriorated concrete, concrete removed, uh, some abrasive sandblasting material is appropriate for the steel right before the new concrete gets poured back in. And the uh, sacrificial zinc anodes are tied to the steel and the electrons want to migrate to those anodes. There's a core of zinc in these anodes and uh, Zinc is less noble than iron, and that's why the electrons would prefer to go to that metal based on its location in the periodic table of elements. So a bit of an overview. Now we're going to get into the meat and potatoes of our presentation here. Some of the testing theory and the equipment and how different energy waves refract and reflect. Uh, we basically try to record the velocity information on these energy waves. We're looking at the time it travels between a known distance, and we're looking at the amplitude or reflection of these energy waves, and there's a relationship between the amplitude of a signal and the frequency of a signal, and we can get a lot of information by analyzing that data. In general, a faster velocity corresponds to a stronger material. <clears throat> so in terms of sonic ultrasonic testing, it is the velocity information primarily of compressional and shear waves that give us the information on the condition of the concrete. The condition we're looking for is the strength and we can interpret that information by the moduli values. I'm talking about Young's modulus, the bulk modulus and Poisson's ratio. Uh, cracking affects how these energy waves propagate through concrete, uh, but we can determine the relative strength of that concrete. Uh, that's the surface velocity of these surface waves. There's also a vertical component, again, where these energy waves are reflected off of various boundary conditions. They give us uh, the thickness of these members. These energy waves will propagate until they impact a boundary condition such as a delamination or the bottom thickness of a deck or maybe the bottom tip elevation of a pile. And we'll talk about all of those. So you put these all together. Uh, NDT has a sonic ultrasonic equipment that 
is comprised of a portable energy source. Uh, it's an air gun that fires a special steel bearing and it's hooked up to a tank of compressed nitrogen. That gun is shown on the right side of this photo. A very repeatable energy source. It's the same mass of the bearing and they're the same pressure of the nitrogen tank. So again, a very repeatable energy source. And then on the left, we're showing a four sensor array. We have to know the distance that these arrays are from the energy source. Each one of those black protrusions are touching the surface of the concrete. There's a little spring sensor on the tips of those. And the distance between sensor A and sensor B, in this case, is six inches. The distance between B and C happens to be 12 inches, and C and D is again 12 inches. So over a 30 inch distance, we're getting information as that energy wave propagates from the energy source. And what do I mean by propagation? I think the best analogy I can come up with is dropping a pebble in a pond of water. And you see the rings on the surface in the two dimensions propagate out from the impact where the stone hit the water. There's also a vertical component, which is the echo or the reflection, the vertical reflection of that same energy that goes down through the water column and gets bounced up back to the surface, kind of like the fish finders or depth, sign, depth sounders locate the bottom of a river or lake. So we've got a surface wave traveling along the surface and from time zero when the energy uh, ball strikes the surface of the concrete. This is just one sensor, but we've got other sensors away from that. And then we've got the reflected energy that bounces off a interface or a boundary condition on whatever we happen to be testing. Now there's a lot more going on here than a bunch of squiggly lines, and we're really interested in the first arrival of these surface waves and reflected waves. The compressional wave usually arrives first, and that is den denoted by uh, a, a blip uh, on the screen. This is the data we see in the field. We record this data and we analyze the data back in the office. Uh, the shear wave has a little higher amplitude. That's usually the second arrival. And then the Rowley wave kind of has a double hitch and that comes in third afterwards. And then after the first arrivals of all three of these waves, there's a whole lot of energy bouncing around back and forth. And we don't get as much information from the secondary or tertiary arrivals, but it's the first arrival of these energy waves and the time that's corresponding to those. Time is on the bottom, uh, decimals of a nanosecond, very, very short increments of time. That's what we're recording in the field. Now with this shear wave and compressional wave velocity information, we have developed a concrete, uh, a curve to reflect the strength of concrete. If we go over to the far right on the vertical pink line, 13,000 feet per second intersects our curve line at about 5,500 PSI. And we compare that to concrete cores all the time. A lot of times we'll identify a high strength area with the sonic testing equipment, a low strength area with the sonic testing equipment. We'll pull a core from each one of those areas. Uh, we'll identify our average strengths ahead of time and the cores generally break within about 500 PSI of that particular value. And uh, I would argue that, you know, taking a core out of its element and breaking it in a lab uh, may not represent the actual in situ compressive strength of a concrete element. In other words, where the internal stresses are acting on the member and the data that we're collecting does represent how different materials and members uh, with internal stresses, what those strengths are. And of course, every time we pull the trigger on the energy source, we get another source of data. A core is just an individual data source uh, that then you kind of have to interpolate how representative is that to the whole area of the column or the beam or the deck. So the sonic ultrasonic testing equipment collects data from two ASTM procedures, pulse velocity out of the concrete spec 597 and impact echo data out of the concrete spec 1383. 
So that vertical component, those red arrows uh, represent the thickness of a concrete. Let's say this is a 10 inch member of concrete with one row of rebar, and we're gonna get a thickness frequency relative to that echo uh, wave that is bouncing back and forth at say 10 inches. And then if you move over to the delaminated area, that may be four inches deep. Well, that's a lot different than the overall thickness of the member. Uh, and that is representative of a debonded area or delaminated area. And the micro cracking within a concrete member, that slows down the velocity. So as we're getting velocity information again from channel A, B, C, and D, we can articulate where the slower velocities are, where the weaker concrete is over the whole member that we're testing. We can also use this equipment to assess the depth of cracks. By doing this, we move the energy source generally away from the visible crack and we hold the receiver in a constant location. Or maybe we keep the energy source in a constant location and we generally move the receivers away from the crack. Uh, and eventually, if the crack is a partial depth crack, we will get a signal that shows up uh, on the other side of the crack and picked up by one of our sensors. And through the geometric calculations, uh, we can determine the relative depth of the crack. Now, if the crack does go through the full thickness of the member, we're just not going to get any signal on the other side and can conclude that uh, this is a structural crack, not a surficial crack. Uh, and that is the information that we would convey uh, as a result of that. So good information on crack assessment, concrete strength assessment, as well as the thickness of various concrete members. The other testing I've just spoke of is where the, where the energy source and the sensors are both on the surface of the concrete. If we have access to both sides of the concrete member we're testing, we can generate a tomographic image and have all these different crossing wave paths. This is very similar to what the medical community does with ultrasonic or ultrasound measurements of some of our organs, our heart or our brain. And once they have that image scanned from the ultrasound on the outside, they slice that member, that organ inside, and look at the inside of that. We do the same thing with concrete by taking these tomographic slices through the concrete member that we're testing. And we uh, may hold the energy source on the right of this column, the yellow bar in the same location, and the energy wave is at station seven. And then we fire it at station eight and fire it at station nine, and then move it around from the east side to the north side to the south and the west. And there's a lot more data collection that we do in the field, and there's certainly more data analysis, but we can generate uh, an in, the internal structure of concrete by these tomographic slices. This is often done on, uh, unfortunately, on new concrete when consolidation issues <clears throat> are present. Uh, the concrete is just not vibrated properly and uh, want to understand what the extent of this honeycombing or a coal joint say if we're waiting for a concrete truck in the middle of summer want to make sure that the top concrete pour is well bonded to the lower concrete section uh, and need to lay out a grid system we would put our sensors over that visible coal joint and if we get a signal say between sensor two and sensor three then that upper concrete is well bonded to the lower concrete and, and appears to be okay. However, if we don't get a signal between those two sensors, then that lower section of concrete has started to set up and the top section of concrete is not well bonded. Uh, so it is a conclusive way to determine the extent of uh, coal joints, uh, horizontal coal joints in fresh concrete. Uh, another example of new concrete uh, was on this large pier uh, over a, a new interstate. Uh, there was precast concrete on the lower section and then another precast concrete section on the upper section where that Y splits out. There was a closure pour in between the two and uh, that concrete strength should have been around 7,000 PSI, 15,000 feet per second that's represented in the blue in the lower left image. 
Uh, we created this tom uh, tomographic image. We had to have two barges and two man lifts and had to make sure that we had good coordinate layout on both sides of this concrete closure pour. We need to have a, a, a pretty accurate X, Y, and Z for all of our data points. But once we have that and create this tomographic image, we take slices. And sure enough, in one of these slices, uh, about three clicks over and four clicks down, uh, it was not 7,000 PSI. Now, fortunately, it wasn't red or orange or you know, garbage or a coffee cup embedded in that concrete, but it was not 7,000 PSI like it was designed for. So this is the type of material uh, testing information that we provide to engineers, and then the engineers and the owner can determine the significance of that particular data. Again, these two examples were on fresh concrete, uh, very applicable to understanding the preservability of existing concrete. In this particular bridge, the superstructure deck and the steel was coming off. It was deemed to be non-salvageable, but the piers were located on piles and well protected uh, from any scour erosion. The question was, is the concrete salvageable? Can we preserve this concrete, not put it in a landfill and not have to expend additional uh, carbon emissions to make new concrete? By looking at the outside of this concrete, one would think, boy, this looks pretty bad. It's all spalled off, some of the rebar is all corroded, but it really comes down to the core concrete strength uh, of this particular peer member. And we were asked to do through testing through this. So once we had an accurate grid set up on both sides of the pier, our energy source is on the left from the barge with the three gentlemen testing there. Uh, and our sensor is on the right uh, with the one individual in a small little John boat. So uh, we're going right through this concrete. We're setting up a tomographic image and then we're taking slices one foot in, two foot in, three foot in. And we were able to determine that the core compressive strength of this concrete pier was sufficient. It was well over 5,000 PSI. It was just deteriorated on the outside and with some chipping, uh, and uh, additional steel that would be drilled and grouted into the remaining concrete core member, uh, that outer shell can be poured back, uh, a very conclusive way to determine that uh, this particular pier and all of these piers on this structure could be preserved. So I want to get into a couple more testing methods. I'm just going to assume that I've done justice to the sonic ultrasonic equipment, uh, the pulse velocity and impact echo. I want to talk a little bit about ground penetrating radar, uh, corrosion potential measurements, referred to as half cell measurements, and uh, share a little bit about uh, how energy waves travel through soil, very similar to concrete, with looking at how a seismic refraction survey is conducted. So to summarize the GPR, uh, there's a lot of different engineering applications and to locate the rebar or the pre-stressing strands, we're working in the high frequency range, 1500 megahertz up to say 2700 megahertz. Uh, this is very good to determine the presence of rebar or pre-stressing strands within the concrete. That electromagnetic energy is reflected off. Uh, a conductive material. Steel is very conductive. Water is conductive. Even air is conductive relative to the concrete matrix or soil around it. Uh, this is very good, again, with different frequencies. Uh, the high frequency isn't going to tell us much of what's underneath the concrete slab, but the mid-range or low frequency GPR is going to tell us that information. Uh, low frequency is also good for site investigations, locating uh, buried approach slabs or uh, underground tanks uh, uh, or even utility locations, kind of taking the call before you dig uh, process to the next level. We do go on uh, private property. We don't just spray up uh, sidewalks with orange paint, uh, but we do locate the depth of various utilities. But the takeaway here for everybody is there a different frequency antenna. So the GPR in this picture, the technician is locating uh, the transverse uh, rebar around the perimeter of this particular pier foundation. He's doing that by going across the transverse steel with vertical data lines of GPR. 
If he was looking for the longitudinal steel, he would be collecting data around the perimeter of this. Uh, this is a handheld mini. It's a frequency of 1500 megahertz and is a self-contained unit. It's about the size of an iron uh, and does not need to be connected to any additional computers or anything. If we go down a little bit on the frequency range, a 900 megahertz antenna is great for a bridge rating analysis of uh, various bridges. So uh, here, this antenna is a little bit bigger. That's the orange box. It is connected to a computer. Uh, those are the wires that are just out of the photo image. Uh, but on uh, this is a bridge over a small stream. We wanted to quantify number one. What's the thickness of the asphalt? Number two, what's the thickness of the concrete slab below the asphalt? And as this arch trails off, uh, how? what is the thickness of the soil of that? These are all the dead loads that go into the calculation for the bridge rating. And does the bridge need to be posted? This is a component of uh, the bridge inspection standards that are required to see if bridge is sufficiently uh, uh, for for the truck traffic. So we need to know the dead load. We would do a surface analysis. We would also take this down below the bridge and collect data on the arch itself. Uh, probably use the high frequency to get the rebar spacing and this 900 megahertz would go further back into uh, the concrete. Uh, a lower frequency would be a 400 megahertz antenna. And this is an example of that. That orange box is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, this is used to characterize utilities and site investigations. So uh, we put it in a little cart, three-wheeled cart. It is hooked up to the computer. We record the data and analyze everything going forward. Uh, the signals that we get uh, are these parabolas. Each on the left side, each one of those peaks or parabolas is representative of an individual rebar. Uh, the stationing is across the top and the vertical depth in the concrete is on the left, the vertical scale. So over a two foot distance, say between station 74 and 76, looks like we got about four rebars. That spacing would be about six inches out and the depth of that rebar would be two inches, maybe two and a half inches, which is a very typical cover depth for a particular concrete member. But over on the right, the signal is washed out. It's an attenuated signal. It's not as clear as it is on the left. So the spacing is still there, but there's some moisture. Maybe there's some cracking, some air voids that are getting in there, some debonding, and that is where the signal gets a little bit fuzzy. So uh, that's how we can, uh, by doing uh, grid spacing and collect data over a certain area, we can get a lot of information on the concrete structure. So here's a picture on the left of the 900 megahertz. Again, it probably isn't going to give us details on the rebar in the wall. It's going to tell us what's behind the wall. Is there voids back there? Is there water, air, root system, or weep holes? Uh, whereas on the right, we've got the handheld mini. We're looking at some uh, concrete, concrete box beams and uh, determining the reinforcing there, the thickness of those commonly used superstructure members. Um, if we can take a couple different GPR antennas with us, we can look at this abutment and what we see and what we know is that it's got graffiti on it and it's got a masonry facade on the face. But by taking the GPR and looking at it horizontally, we can articulate the thickness of that masonry face. That's the yellow solid bright line. Uh, on the abutment, and then the back side of that abutment has a batter, just like we would expect a gravity abutment to flare out at the bottom, and we can get the geometry of that thickness of the wall. And then by looking at it vertically, let's understand what this gravity structure is sitting on. Conclusively, we could determine, we determined that this abutment was founded on bedrock, uh, so before all we had was a masonry, masonry facade with graffiti. Now we know the dimensions and we know what it is founded on. Uh, I want to talk a little bit now about a different test method, uh, corrosion potential measurements, often referred to as half cell measurements. This is ASTM 876. We have to make a positive connection to the black steel. So we drill and chip and expose where that rebar is uh, and 
and the image in the right is our positive connection uh, with a wire to, to the rebar. And then all we do is just touch the surface of the concrete uh, with that copper, copper sulfate half cell uh, sponge, if you will. It's a little bit wet. We lay out a grid system. Maybe it's a two foot by two foot grid system. Uh, so the process is again, locate the rebar. That's where the GPR comes in drill to the steel so we can make a connection. Don't want to damage it. We just want to drill into it. Uh, and then once we have that positive connection, we just touch the surface. We make sure that everything's working and we're recording these measurements and then calibrating, collecting the data and then analyzing that over the whole area of the concrete member that we're investigating. Uh, the seismic refraction survey is looking at waves of energy and how they propagate through soil. That's ASTM D577. That's in the geotechnical side of the ASTM specs. Our energy source is not the air gun. This is a black powder uh, shotgun shell, uh, or we could also take a sledgehammer and hit a plate if we're not looking uh, too deep into the ground. And our receivers are not six inches or 12 inches apart. They're generally hydrophones or geophones that are spaced five or possibly 10 feet apart. So we can have 100 foot arrays or 200 foot arrays, even 400 feet that are on the surface of the ground. A geophone is just a, a magnet uh, suspended by a little spring that picks up any and all vibrations and a hydrophone just senses any pressure waves in the water. But the velocity, the rock strength is, can be calculated uh, and determined by shear wave velocity. Uh, Caterpillar to this day uses shear wave velocity to determine some of their equipment for rock ripability. RQD, looking at how cores come out with the soil borings, as well as compression testing, if there was a large enough piece of uh, the rock to be broken is another way to do that. One thing to note here is generally we wanna, for whatever vertical distance we're looking in the ground, we wanna have three times that distance on the surface. So if we're looking down 100 feet, we wanna have at least 300 feet of geophones across the surface. An example, a case study where we did this refraction survey was and uh, uh, a proposed new bridge. Um, and the water depth here was 12 to 18 inches. So. Uh, a barge probably wouldn't float. We'd almost have to take a, a track mounted drill rig out there and that presents its own challenges. But in the course of two days, we were able to cover the whole profile of this new alignment and that's represented in the uh, hypotenuse uh, of this particular image. Uh, early on in the design process, the span lengths had not been determined. Uh, even the foundation type, shallower spread footing or piles had not been determined. So in two days, over about 1200 foot distance, we were able to determine that the uh, rock was sufficient strength. The depth was between 12 and 16 feet. So piles were not necessary and the geotechnical design finalized all those foundation details and the structural design completed the span length. So uh, continuous data, uh, whether it's a contour or a profile cut, very efficient, very cost effective. Uh, now, the general subsurface layering information certainly isn't going to be sufficient for the foundation design analysis, but it does give us an idea of where the overburdens are on the top, where some of the uh, uh, granular fill materials may be between two and 4,000 feet per second, and then where the high velocity material is, 10,000, 15, even up to 20,000 feet per second for the rock. Uh, the granites and the schists are very, very strong rock layers. So we're going to do a little bit uh, more case studies and examples of different concrete bridge elements and where this testing is very applicable. Concrete decks, top the list. Here we've got our sonic wheel that has been uh, designed and uh, retrofitted with an energy source, which is on the right side of that wheel. And our sensors are mounted right on the three wheels of that deck wheel. We just push that along the deck and it goes click, 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 collecting data. 
Uh, and then on the right, uh, we have GPR ground coupled GPR with a high frequency antenna. We're tracking our stationing and we can collect data on a bridge deck, very typical bridge deck, uh, two main spans, two approach spans uh, in one day, uh, characterizing where the good concrete is and the percentage of that good concrete, maybe in green, where the uh, moderate concrete is, uh, less than the less than the good stuff and what the percentage is of the bad concrete. Now, generally in this particular case, which is the most common area, the, the, the weaker concrete is around the header by the expansion joints near the scuppers, kind of even where the puddles are forming. So this can be used for partial depth deck replacements and even come up with repair quantities for that type of investigation. If we're looking at uh, assessing uh, pier supports of a structure or the beams at the top of those supports, uh, we need a man lift to get up there. Again, we have to have access and touch the face of the structure we're evaluating. Uh, up in that man lift, uh, we've got GPR here. We were locating transverse tendons to be tested and understanding what the uh, rebar configuration was for the as-built conditions. Uh, sometimes we get need to get underneath the bridge and uh, we do that by uh, using a reverse articulating man lift. I call it a UB, an under bridge inspection unit is very common. Uh, it does have to take up uh, a lane of traffic, but gives us full access to the bottom side of the bridge. Testing these precast box beams, what's the thickness? What's the strength of that? The GPR would tell us what the reinforcing and where the pre-stressing strands are. Uh, here's the same sort of precast beams uh, on a single span bridge where we had access uh, in this marine environment from a boat um, and comparing the design conditions to the as-built conditions. In that upper right, we would hope and expect to have five and a half inches of concrete thickness on the bottom of that beam. Very critical, uh, not only for the strength and but the thickness to embed the pre-stressing strands and rebar within that beam. Um, didn't always get five and a half inches in this particular case. Now we have to reverse our thinking here. We're looking down, so the bottom of the beam is at the top of the image, and the green line is five and a half inches down. So we would expect uh, to have five and a half inches. It's the red line of what we found, and uh, the red line is maybe two and a half inches thick of concrete. So there's a big void between the concrete that was poured and the bottom of the beam or where the voided styrofoam uh, blockout kicks in. And you would expect to have all of the concrete, all of the rebar and pre-stressing strands embedded in the concrete. Not really the case. Uh, here the pre-stressing strands were not embedded. In fact, there's even corrosion that's started to uh, affect the integrity. If left untouched, uh, that's gonna continue to deteriorate those pre-stressing strands. That's the primary component of this type of construction. Um, piles, we do an awful lot of testing of piles. Here we're gonna look at the impact echo or the vertical part of our testing. And we're gonna be recording the time it takes for an energy wave to go down to the tip of the pile and bounce back to the top. Uh, we're also going to be recording the velocity of the energy waves in that particular pile. We have the time, we have the velocity, easy to calculate the distance. Just got to remember that it's a two-way travel time because it goes down, bounces off the tip, and comes back up. Now in concrete, if there's an inclusion in the, say, drilled shaft or caisson or what have you, we may get a secondary reflection, which is substantially shorter than the full length of the pile. And with access to the top out of a large diameter structure, we can move around uh, the north quadrant, the south, the east, and the west, and try to determine the extent of that anomaly. Maybe the concrete placement techniques were poor. Maybe there's some groundwater. Uh, that creeped in on the concrete as the casings or the cans, as I call them, were getting pulled. Uh, the testing of piles, we do test concrete piles, we test timber piles, and we test steel piles, all types of them. Uh, here we've got concrete piles on the left. Sometimes we use the gun, sometimes we use a hammer. Sheet pile in the middle. On the right, we're testing timber piles. Uh, here's some more timber pile testing. We have a ratchet strap that attaches the sensors right to the side of the pile. 
I uh, generally use a hammer on the, the wood piles to get the length of the piles. The middle one shows us a two sensor array, and we always want to measure what the depth is to the mud line of the pile. Sometimes we have a secondary reflection just based on the geotechnical surrounding characteristics, uh, may get a, a secondary wave uh, bounce back to the surface, say if it goes into a dense clay. So if there is boring information, that's very valuable uh, and, uh, and useful. Testing sheet pile, we do it all the time. On the left, you can see all of the extent of our equipment. Our tank of nitrogens on the bottom. We got a little cart up there, our computer, uh, and all of our cables and batteries. So we're very self-contained and, and portable. Um, on the right, we're testing a uh, pipe pile. Sometimes these are filled with concrete, sometimes they're not. This happened to be at a marina where there was a tidal fluctuation and the marine docks are going up and down. Uh, as far as steel sheet pile tieback investigations, we might, we will test the length of the pile, but then the sheet piles have tiebacks and the tiebacks are connected to an anchorage or a dead man. So when we locate where those are, they could be exposed. And then by exposing one or two of them, uh, we would use GPR. That's going to tell us the rebar spacing. The low frequency on the right is going to tell us maybe the depth of that. Maybe that's three feet deep. Maybe it's four feet deep. So good information to determine the capacity of the sheet pile wall. While it's exposed, we'll take the sonic ultrasonic equipment. Let's get the strength of that concrete and by the way, we've got that impact echo reflected vertical wave. We're going to verify the thickness, <clears throat> three feet or four feet of that dead man and, and correlate that and compare that to the results of the GPR. Uh, another good case study here was uh, a small locally owned bridge. It was posted and it was an awful long detour associated with this. There was perforations in the flanges and web of all six of these piles and uh, by wanted to repair them, but didn't know the extent of the length of the piles or what the piles were founded on. So the ref seismic refraction survey confirmed that the depth of the bedrock was about 22 feet down from the waterline. We tested the length of the pile. You guessed it. The pile lengths were embedded 22 feet from the waterline, so we confirmed they were end bearing H piles. Safe to dig down in the riverbed. Uh, either put a jacket on these piles, or in this case, I think they put some structural steel, some splices over the perforations, uh, patched it up, uh, was able to remove the load posting, and the detour did not apply. Other marine structures, uh, here we're looking at the concrete deck, the concrete beams, or the piles that support everything. Here we're testing the top of that uh, similar marine structure for uh, delaminations, debonding, uh, some of the corrosion the, can get in there from the salt water or if uh, de-icing salts are used, uh, way to quantify that. Um, we do have uh, sometimes underwater access to the pile is the only way to get to the face. Uh, our equipment is waterproof and we put it in the hands of divers all the time. Uh, we communicate with the diver, making sure they record a good data test and then we can move on from that. Uh, to the other ones. Uh, the other bridge component is post-tension tendons, and if those tendon ducts are grouted like they should be, our energy wave will pass right through them. If there's an air void or a water void or maybe grout that just never set up, uh, it's going to be a longer travel path for the energy wave to go around the tendon duct. And the thickness is related to the frequency, the travel distance that that travels through. Now, we don't have to worry about locating external tendons. They are where they are. They're visible. These are pulling together uh, hollow um, sections of brig, bridge segmental sections. Uh, and we would test through the tendon duct to determine if there was voiding in there. And in this case, right around 40, station 42, the amplitude of that signal walks right out, gets a little bit wider. The four above it are not as bad. The six below it, the amplitude is what we're looking for, but uh, right around 42 where that yellow is, that's where the signal walks out. The internal tendons, uh, you need to find those uh, first. That's where the GPR can locate them, and uh, we can differentiate between the reinforcing of the uh, parabolas of the steel and where the post-tension tendon ducts are. 
And once we locate them, we would do the sonic testing right over them to determine are there voids uh, over those tendon ducts. And we also need to do a couple of openings. Each bridge is a little bit unique, so we've got uh, a lot of experience carefully drilling uh, and uh, opening the tendon duct. We don't want to damage it, and we certainly don't want to damage the strands. What we want to do is to get a bore scope in and document the voids and the corrosion conditions of this particular void. And all of these eight images show voids, and, and certainly in the upper left, you can see the corrosion that's already started. Uh, the lower right, that's a vertical tendon, so there's a huge air void, and then there's some amount of water below that. Um, and once the corrosion starts on these tendons, it rapidly advances. And if you see one of these tendons that are broken or severely corroded, question is, <clears throat> how is the other tendon duct doing? And once we're done, we want to seal the hole. We don't want to let any moisture get in. Uh, and uh, maybe there's a temporary seal or a permanent seal. There might be some additional work. So. Uh, just to, to recap here, if there's no plans available on a, a bridge, maybe it's a locally owned small structure, we can quantify the reinforcing, the integrity of the concrete and the thickness of the various members. Um, masonry structures, some historic structures, again, might not have any plans available and we can quantify all of that. Precast structures, there's a set of plans that were around somewhere, but they didn't make it over to the bridge file. So. Uh, helping the owners understand uh, the integrity of their bridges. Uh, you know, briefly, we do do uh, other types of uh, condition assessments in the hydro market, uh, power generation, concrete draft tubes. Um, also, uh, one particular project, there was a steel liner that was being placed inside a concrete draft tube. And the question was, there was supposed to be grout around the outside of the steel. Well, did they get the grout everywhere? Was it well bonded between that one inch gap on the outside of the steel liner and the existing concrete uh, draft tube? We look at our amplitudes again of our signal that I started with. Uh, if it's well bonded without any voids, we're gonna have a tight amplitude, that signature uh, image that we look for is in the top example. Now, if it's debonded a little bit, but there still is grout in there, uh, that amplitude would stretch out a little bit, but we would still have our initial arrivals. If there just wasn't any grout up there and there was a big void, that amplitude would stretch right out and that needed to be topped off and add a little bit more grout to the structure. We were on site and were able to determine that while the grouting contractor was still on site. Spillway testing, uh, we do a lot of that. The first part is evaluate the concrete spillway. The second part is what's underneath the concrete spillway. Maybe it's on rock, maybe it's on uh, fill or rubble, or maybe it's on uh, a void underneath it. There's been a lot of sediment transport that's carried a lot of the sand or the material away from underneath the spillway. And when we can uh, determine with a uh, drill hole, what the size of that void is that lends itself to a quantity of grout repairs that might be applicable. <clears throat> we also test pipes, whether it's from the inside of the pipe or from the outside of the pipe for distribution, municipal water distribution or collection systems. Uh, a tunnel is just a big pipe. We can also put all of our equipment on extension poles and we're uh, pretty innovative when it comes to accessing different parts of different infrastructure assets. Uh, and uh, we, we need to get access to them and the deploying a underwater ROV, remote operated vehicle. We've got some collaborative partners that we work with in the commercial diving industry. We've mounted our sonic equipment on top of that ROV. As well as a robot, we've mounted our equipment on uh, that robot that can get into some unique and challenging uh, access parts safely. Um, uh, finally here, I think the last slide I've got is uh, we were involved with a research project with the Federal Railroad Administration to assess cracking in concrete ties. And uh, we chose to do that with microphone technology, uh, evaluating uh, how those energy waves go through the concrete. We put two microphones on either side of each rail and then walked behind this push cart. 
Ben, I, I've covered, I think, just about everything I wanted to. I think I'm going to give control back to you, if that's okay, and we'll see if we have any uh, particular uh, questions out there. Well, thanks, Bill, for that awesome presentation and killing all those questions. Uh, if you guys want to ask Bill any more questions, you can find his contact information on the screen right now. You can find the recording of this presentation, future presentations, and previous presentations on our website at wesavestructures.info. Uh, in the events section, just select which of the series you're interested in, and you'll find the recording there as well as the slides that were used. Thanks again, Bill, for putting on this great presentation. Very good. Thank you, everybody, for your time. I hope everyone has a wonderful day.